Welcome to the Smart Business Revolution. 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 Do you want a revolution? Whoa. You say you want a revolution. Revolution. The revolution. It's going on right now. Welcome to the Revolution, the Smart Business Revolution podcast, where we ask today's most successful entrepreneurs to share the tools and strategies they use to build relationships and connections to grow their revenue. Now, now, your host for the Revolution, John Corcoran. All right, welcome everyone. John Corcoran here. I'm the host of this show. If you are new to listening to this show, go check out some of our past interviews with smart CEOs, founders, and entrepreneurs, ranging from companies like Netflix, Kinko's, YPO, EO, Activation Blizzard, Lending Tree, and many more. I'm also the co-founder of Rise 25, where we help connect B2B business owners to their ideal prospects. And my guest here today is Jamie Birch. He is the founder and CEO of JEB Commerce, and he is also the host of the Profitable Performance Marketing Podcast. Go check that out on your podcasting app of choice. Um, and we also are both members of the Bureau of Digital Community. Big shout out to that community there and to Carl Smith, who runs that community. Great guy, brings a lot, together a lot of great agency uh, owners to share ideas. Um, and of course, this episode brought to you by my company, Rise25, where we help B2B businesses to get clients, referrals, and strategic partnerships with Done For You Podcast and content marketing, you can go to rise25media.com to learn more about us. All right, uh, Jamie, a pleasure to have you here today. And, um, we, you know, we both graduated from college around the same time, so 98, 99 timeframe. And what I love about that time frame is the internet was just exploding at that time. It was just such the wild west. And I, I mean, I can remember distinctly, like, you know, first time getting onto the internet. I can remember getting an email account. I can remember, like, from dorm rooms trying to tinker around and kind of learn about this thing and check the weather in Australia and weird stuff like that, that kind of blew my mind about the potential and the first, you know, um, you know, graphic inter net Netscape, you know, using those types yeah. of browsers. Tell me for you um, what your first experiences were with the internet, because obviously it has a huge impact on your business, a huge impact yeah. on your career, but when were the first like realizations for you and experiences with it? Gosh, I mean, I had a Commodore 128 in the 80s, and I would have to dial in to a BBS. Wow. And early that was day. my early, early days. So that was, and I would sit in the basement and program in basic, uh, you know, just lines lit up, moving around and, and, and dialing into these uh, bulletin board systems. That was probably the first time of like, oh, there's, this is fun um, and it's interesting and no one else that I know is really doing it. Um, but then I think as I graduated college years later and trying to just figure out what, what I wanted to do, um, I hadn't really done a lot, uh, really kept up with it. I, I think the biggest interaction I had during college was on the Pine system sending email if you remember that the oh, colleges had it vaguely, was that big yellow screen you'd yeah. have to go to the library to get it and i just remember emailing my uh computer science um uh cousin who had graduated four years before and worked at ibm and it was they were silly little emails you know like i can't believe we're talking without talking kind of stuff <laughs> uh and then as i started to look for work I, the big thing was my, as I'm looking for all these different types of jobs and really from door and window manufacturing to targets management program to uh, finance and investing um, in those fields, my dad, as, as I'm going through the interview process, he sent me an article of this 21 year old uh, Internet millionaire um, driving a Bugatti. And I, I love the this kid was two years younger than me. Um, I'd love the idea of being a millionaire in my twenties or ever. Uh, and I'd loved fast, expensive cars. Um, I had a 73 Ford F two fifty that barely ran. So the idea of having a really nice car yeah. at this age was intriguing. And so that really was a time of like, Whoa, maybe there's something here. What, what's really going on. And then I shifted my interview process to find dot com companies uh, that you know we're looking for people who 
uh, could make it work and whatever that whatever that meant. And so uh, that's where I found myself at a company in Post Falls, Idaho, uh, you know, in the middle of kind of nowhere, uh, working for a company that was trying to piece together medical e-commerce, election, SaaS, what, what we didn't know then, but now I, you would call sort of a, a SaaS uh, offering and, and marketplace builder at the time. Uh, and it was, it was amazing. Once we got there, then we really saw the potential. We saw, I saw dollars coming in to the company and stethoscopes and blood pressure cuffs and medical books being sold. Uh, and that was probably where we, I saw when I loved what I was doing and saw the impact of, uh, the internet. And you were doing what really became SEO, very early SEO at this point, right? Yeah, and probably a lot of it would be considered black hat at this point. But in '99, I mean, we had no hats. Nothing, was, nothing was just, black hat at that point. It was all, yeah. or it was all black hat. <laughs> it was all black hat. It was all white hat. No one really knew what was going on. Yeah, my first job was SEO guru, and uh, uh, if they had printed business cards, that's what would have been on it. And I showed up, and they gave me a, an old e machine uh, and a, a card table in a huge sort of auditorium and said, uh, get the rankings and stuff. Cause no one understood yeah. what it was. Someone in the organization was like, look, we need search engine results. What are those? I don't know. Hire some kid to go figure that out. And that's exactly what they did. And um, so this company that you worked for, you were employee number 179. Uh, They end up getting up to about 300 and then shrunk back down again. So we're talking, you know, dot com 2001 time period here. You saw them explode and then ride all the way back down and you were down to four employees left and you were one of the last ones left. And then one of the co-founders saw you in the hallway and said, we need to talk. Yeah. Yeah. And there wasn't, you know, we had a huge office building and so it's not like all four of us sat in the same area. So you could go a couple of days without seeing anyone. And yeah, I heard him say, Hey, Jamie. And and I turned a corner and and he said, come here. And I went, Nope. (laughs) I turned around and literally made him follow me around the office until he, he cut me off somewhere. And he's like, look, we got to talk. I'm like, I don't know if we have to, I know what's going on. Uh, And he's like, come back to my office. And he let me go on the way back. And I looked at him and said, well, you know, we have like, all these workstations, all this computer equipment. How about I fill up my car and take what I can? And, you know, would, would that be okay? He's like, oh yeah, take what you can. So I put huge flatbed scanners in my car, wow. huge, you know, monitors that, you know, weighed like 70 pounds and just filled that up. And um, at the time, we, I think- What were you thinking? Were you just thinking like, oh, I need to be scrappy and maybe I can start a business with these or I can sell them or what? I was thinking I'd start a business. Uh, I had uh, two kids at the time and I was 25 and I just was like, I don't, how is this happening? How, how, what do I do? I was really kind of panicking. Um, You know, the other part of the story I usually don't tell is after I put all that stuff in my car, I just sat there and cried. I had no idea. This is the first time I, up until that point, I've never been laid off. I haven't heard of a layoff. I, I had worked kind of, from 12 years old until that day and had always left a job or moved and got in. A, I've never experienced that. So a bit of it was like, I, I, I remember my dad going through the transition process. And I remember him uh, talking about like, you, you, you have to ask for things in that moment um, or you won't get it. And I thought, well, I did. I was really successful in the SEO and affiliate and email stuff that I was doing for that organization. Maybe I could figure something out, but I need to ask for as much as I can. And I know this company's broke, so it's I'm not going to get a severance package. But there's a lot of stuff here that maybe I could start a business. Um, and we we tried to start a web dev company after that and marketing and and it didn't work for for years later. But yeah, I was thinking there are all these tools here. That at the time, a young man starting out, young family, <laughs> had no money to buy any of that stuff. So let yeah. me get everything. I even think I threw a chair in there. <laughs> Great presence <laughs> of mind to uh, actually speak up and, and ask for those things at this extremely traumatic, traumatic, um, you know, moment in your life where you're 
you're experiencing such a big setback. Yeah, I had, you know, I have been side by side with my dad through his climbing up the ladder and transitions. And we're the family that talked about those things at the dinner table. It wasn't hidden from us. Like we went, you know, when my dad would experience a layoff or need to leave a job and, and or need to take a step up, we did that stuff as a family. So it was it, you know, our dinner table could could be kind of weird. You know, we talk about those types of things. And, and yeah, so in the moment, I think it was shock of like, but then again, we had gone through weeks and weeks of going from 300 people down to four. So it wasn't a surprise when it happened, but yeah, it it was, uh, what, what can I do right now to at least position myself for some sort of, you know, whatever that next step is. Yeah. And now years later, 15 years later, you actually ran into this person, this founder that, that gave you the day off uh, on an airplane and you had a chance to tell him um, what the impact was. Tell us about that. Yeah. I, uh, uh, you know, you go through stages and, and as you know, being 25 and getting fired, you know, I, I really despised all the founders, you know, for my, where my situation was, um, but over the years, you 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 get good perspective. And um, I went to sit down on an air, airplane, and right next to me was uh, the HR, uh, the VP of HR of of from Netivation. And I just I and I'm laughing to myself because I know he had I at this point in my life I could empathize with him, like I I'm running a business I've had to let people go. Um, and it's really hard and it never really gets easier and you really impact lives. And so I had a lot of empathy. And, and so I was kind of laughing and, um, you do the small talk and I just said, you don't, you don't recognize me, do you? And he's like, no, I said, I used to work at Netivation. He's like, oh no. <laughs> I said, I said, do you, do you remember, you know, letting me go? And he's like, we did that a lot. You know, we had to do that a lot. It was a difficult time. And so I told him the story and and we laughed how I, you know, uh, ran the other way, essentially, when he uh, uh, when he was it was time to to let me go. Uh, and it was a really good uh, experience for me. I hope it was for him. Um, you know, as a business owner, when you have to make tough decisions, those decisions affect people's lives. And no matter how tough it is as the leader, um, you, you don't always get that empathy from, you know, employees and former employees. So I knew how important it was to, uh, you know, if, if I let someone go and years later, they come back and tell me that the experience was good, that would mean a whole lot. So I knew I, I wanted to do that with him. We had a great flight. Um, we didn't particularly get along well before, but we didn't have a whole lot of interaction and we just had a great flight. It was a, a good time to, uh, to reminisce about the company's uh, quick expansion. And that all happened from me joining to me leaving in, in 11 months back then. Wow. So it was Crazy. rapid rise and, and yeah. fall very quickly. Yeah. Um, now, it was from that experience that you discovered affiliate marketing. And, and we're talking, this is 20 years ago now. What, uh, first of all, why were you so drawn to affiliate marketing? What was it about you personally that you really uh, made it resonate that it would become a big part of your career? Well, at the time, I, you know, I took that job partly because the other um, type of work I was looking at was a five to 10 year training program. And a a 34 year old just felt so old to me back then. (laughs) And, (laughs) And I just, I thought, well, I could probably, if I show ability to take responsibility, be successful at it and kind of grok new things quickly. They're just going to throw more things at me. And that's what they did. And it was, you know, paid search when that came out. Uh, and then email when we were using email to do marketing instead of, we did a lot of two page letters at the time. So I did some work on actual, you know, direct mail pieces and then um, affiliate got thrown in my lap and it wasn't so much. I sought it out, but this kind of fed all the, or it scratched all the itches. Um, It was relational. And I love talking to people. I love meeting people. And I love being part of someone else's success, even if it's just a little bit. Um, It was strategic. 
So you're working with other partners and like, you know, trying to understand their audience and how they reach them um, and how you can add to their experience for their audience with what you have and trying to figure that out. And it was rapidly, you know, there's rapid feedback. So you could do a campaign just like paid search. You could do a thing and you'd see very quickly what the results were. And I love that. I love to be able to, we would, you know, spend some money here and we'd see the results and I'd be able to tell everyone what happened uh, and why, and, and then be able to direct our budget and things that way. So those, uh, those things led me to just, this is, this is what I want to do. Um, uh, SEO was great for a time. I learned a ton uh, and I really enjoyed doing it. Paid search was also fun, but it didn't have the relational um, you know, aspect right. to it. And that really spoke to me because you can, and that's one thing that's not changed with affiliate in the 22 years. Um, if you don't have solid relationships with people, if you don't have a good network, if you're not uh, uh, nourishing that and building it, constantly adding it, taking care of it, um, you're not going to be successful. So that spoke to me years later. Um, I did a personality test for uh, when I was at Coldwater Creek and I heard my boss, you know, yelling my name down the, the hallway. And usually that's not a great thing. <laughs> And she just, she laid down the Gartner. I think it was Gartner. Strengths finder. Strengths finder. And she yeah. goes, if I had thought about this before I hired you, you, your profile would have been exactly what the job needed. And it was just. The Do you key remember what the, what the term was? Does they use individual terms? I don't remember the term, but it was like strategic relational yeah. communication. Was it those blue? things? Was it woo? There was woo. Yeah, yeah. Me too, man. That's the yeah. same. I got the exact same thing. I think they brothers and like, woo. <laughs> you get like three words, and and I did it at this group of gathering of entrepreneurs, and like the person at the front of the room said, "Oh, and uh, John Corkin, you're a woo," and I was like, "What's that?" And they explained it. I was yeah. like, "Bingo." <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. I, mean, I didn't know it at the time. I was like, "Okay," it was uncomfortable because she was really excited, and I didn't know what all I. I thought I was going to be in trouble. Yeah. Uh, but so your boss was probably like, I hired the right person for the She job. was, she was <laughs> so excited. And that was actually, I had interviewed at that company before I went to Seattle and it was such a long interview. It was like 11 hours in one day. It probably was like more like seven, but it felt like 12 hours at the end. The VP asked me, you know, what what I thought about it. And I'm like, I want to eat. That's what I think about it. Mm. I I had four people interview me during lunch. I couldn't even pick up my sandwich. Uh. And so the the process for interviewing with that boss was a 30 minute interview. We got along really well. And and I'm so glad I went there as one of the the most impactful um uh managers I've ever had. So um for those, let's take a step backwards. For those who don't yeah. know what affiliate marketing is, why don't you explain kind of how it works? Yeah, so it is very simple, uh, selling other people's things. So your, your affiliates have an audience uh, and it's, it's a form of advertising. Um, so publishers and affiliates have an audience. Um, you as an advertiser or retailer want to get in front of that audience you have several ways of doing that, several different channels, PR, social, paid search, email, display, uh, and affiliate. So affiliate, uh, the publisher is paid a commission based on what they sell. So if I'm working with um, Cabela's uh, as an advertiser and my publisher is um, a phishing site and they promote one of my uh, rod and reel packages, and they sell thousand dollars, they may get a hundred bucks on that. So super advantageous for the advertiser. They get to expand their reach dramatically and pay after something good happens instead of putting money out and hoping good things happen and then adjusting on a kind of lagging indicators. Uh, they get to uh, realize the sale, uh, pay a commission after the fact. Uh, and then pour into what's actually working. Uh, and publishers, it, it's a whole realm of distribution that if you're not working in it, you're not having access to those customers. Affiliates have, one of the things that's changed from when I started till now is they've done an incredible job of building a brand, 
and building brand loyalty to the affiliate, not to the advertiser or retailer. So it's essentially uh, uh, increasing your distribution and it's a model for paying for that uh, advertising distribution on a commission uh, basis. And do you find now when you are um, com now compared to when you were doing it years ago, now are, is there less education involved or you still have clients that come to you where you need to kind of explain to them how it works? Yeah, there's still a lot of education involved. Um, you know, it's not a track taught in college and usually your CMOs and your your uh, your C level executives didn't come up through that channel, so there's still a lot of education involved. But it is changing. There's um, a lot more available, uh, and CMOs and executives are are getting uh, you know more comfortable with uh, the channel. The biggest education now is is how much technology is available to uh, to ensure you're getting you know good quality sales. They're not interfering with other channels. Um, and you know, you're getting really good customer acquisition through it. And, and we were talking before, and you said one of the interesting things about it is that the world of PR and the world of affiliate marketing are kind of merging in a sense. So talk a little bit about how you're observing that. Yeah, it's a really, you know, we saw it start to happen right before uh, the pandemic. And I think that kind of was a catalyst for those things. Um, as we we all kind of navigated these last two years with uh, not really knowing what is going to go on uh, three months from now, um, it required a lot of us to be way more accountable to what is happening with our marketing dollars. Uh, and I think that really pushed uh, the PR channel into, you know, how do we report on this you know, better? What different KPIs can we use? How do we track all these activities? At the same time, affiliate platforms and technologies were going well beyond last click and, and well beyond just a simple link on a website to being able to be tracked in just about every channel in every way through uh, key, QR codes and all sorts of uh, uh, coupon codes and once the affiliates uh, and the platforms created and um, equipped the industry with tracking beyond first click, that combined with what all the changes going into PR kind of have led to this wonderful merging. Mm. Um, now, tell us about you had been um, you you went on to Coldwater Creek, which one of the national uh, was a national women's retailer. Yeah. Um, had 700 mil, several, several hundred million in sales, but you actually started the affiliate program, saw it go from zero to 35 million. Um, this yeah. is, you know, post.com era. What were things like for you then? What, what was it compared to like what the world is like now? I imagine a lot different. Yeah, well, there was uh, still um, a lot of excitement about the web, um, you know, during the boom in 99, 2000. You know, there was a, all the web teams got a lot of treats and massages and, you know, fully stocked kitchens and things like that. Um, as the bubble burst, a lot of that went away. But Coldwater Creek still had a lot of that because the they really found uh, how the digital arm augments everything else going on. And uh, and so it was still very much uh, a lot of opportunity to test, uh, to try brand new things. Um, and really any idea we could come up with to expose ourselves to uh, new audiences and engage with them, like we tested and we tried. Um, and so that was a really, really exciting time. Uh, and for me, that that idea of if I showed um, ability to uh, be responsible for the thing that they gave me, I would get more that kept happening. So it was more and more and more um, that. Uh, uh, that I got exposure to paid search uh, started to come out with go to.com back then. Uh, and so we did a bunch of things like that. Um, I think what has changed is the barrier to entry for publishers was super low. So you could put a site out there and you could, you know, fill your meta tags and you could get rankings and traffic. Um, and so the quality of the affiliates, um, some were great, some were not, and the sophistication of the the people at the controls, so your affiliate managers and things, was uh, was always lagging behind the publishers. So there was a lot of fraud. There was a lot of things being done that 
um, were hard to find, hard to track. And that led to um, what typically is and can be and is in many cases for our clients, very efficient channel, very cost-effective channel. Um, it increased costs, it increased you know, problems. Um, and nowadays we have so much technology to take care of that. Our affiliate managers are so much more sophisticated. We can tell when someone's breaking terms and conditions. We have so many tools to protect the advertiser's dollar and protect their other channels. Um, and it is, it is amazing what we can do, what we can find and how we manage those things as opposed to back then. It really was the wild west. And if you could generate sales on a last click, you got promoted. And there's a lot of affiliates that we worked with back then that, were, that aren't around anymore because they were doing things that no one would want done right now to generate a sale. Uh, and so the technology is vastly different than it ever was. You know, and, and another interesting development with it, of course, is social media. People can build audiences um, across a lot of different channels now. And so talk a little bit about the impact that that has had, how, how that's changed um, the world for publishers. Yeah, well, we've gone through this cycle of first influencers and, and these social channels came out and a lot of people were asking for big dollars to be involved in it. Um, and then we kind of found out that they were, uh, a lot of them were garbage. Those followers weren't there and the, the ROI wasn't there. You'd spend five to 30 grand and you'd get really nothing in return. And you, you couldn't even show that there was brand awareness made. So then there was sort of a backlash against that channel. Um, and then all those networks started to clean up their numbers and the affiliate community, the platforms and the networks that we work with came out with really great tools to track what was going on in those channels and how to do that. The industry kind of figured it out. Uh, and so now it's a much different ballgame. It's very important uh, for any advertiser, any retailer to have a strong social channel. It's easily tracked. It's easily protected. And if you think about, I'm, I'm sure your purchasing process is very similar to mine. Um, if, if you're looking for something or even not, but someone you trust yeah, recommends sure. something, you know, sure. you're going to buy it. And now it's happening uh, with the new tools that we have. It's happening even outside of, uh, of the digital space. I, my family, we spend most of our time when we're not working or in school on horseback. And we follow certain, uh, you know, influencers and teachers and clinicians there. And some of them are using affiliate marketing tools on the side of their trailers. They're mm. talking about it in their clinics and people are able to go to a website or use a QR code or click, you know, type that link in their mobile phone. It's all able to be tracked. Uh, and that is, uh, you know, a whole new world. It's super fun. It, it, in some ways, it's really exciting you know, for example, um, we just did a couple of repairs at our home renovations on kitchen and, and stuff like that. And so I had to make decisions about what sink do you buy and what tile do you use and all this kind of stuff. And I was going on YouTube all the time because the last time I was making re repairs, my home was years ago. And now there's th these amazing different people out there that are putting out educational content. And previously, like even before these tools existed, they didn't, wouldn't have a way of monetizing or, or making money, you know, and now these people that maybe, you know, they, they're a handyman or they're a painter or they're a woodworker or something like that. They have this additional channel that that can generate some revenue for their business, support their family. And I think that's a wonderful thing. Yeah, and it, it it's providing really good content. Like there's one individual who I think it's like it's like things um, your dad should have taught you, or or <laughs> yeah, and he does all these videos, and yeah, it's and it's super easy to create that content now, and and you know, um, we we record a lot of our stuff with our phones. I did a yeah. whole blog or a, a vlog series over the pandemic and my daughter recorded me on my Android phone and it's really high quality. So I think the tools make it simple and then the monetization give that incentive uh, for people to do it. Now you still have to be, you have to be good with video, yeah, <laughs> you know, to do that, but yeah. And it, and so we used to, you know, it was, it's always been about, you know, references. It's always been about social proof for ages, right? But now we have such good content online 
um, no matter what niche we're in or whether we're, you know, rehabbing a house or um, learning how to, you know, get ready for our first show on horses or anything like that. There's so much good content out there. Um, and, and that's where advertisers need to figure out how to, to get into there and provide really good content to do that. It, and social is going to just continue to grow. Right. Right. Now for, for you, for running the business, um, uh, you've got a, a couple of different verticals you focus on outdoor gear, health and beauty, travel and apparel. Um, how do you manage to develop relationships with, uh, you know, publishers in all these different segments, maintain those relationships, and then also kind of decide on, you know, um, how you manage that relationship. And, and um, you know, if you've got different clients that you're working with, which ones you should, you know, you should you should uh, use for different offers? Well, first, it's a good uh, uh, CRM tool. So you can keep track of those things. A lot of it is time on board. Um, and, you know, we hire natural relationship builders. You know, you, you need that. You, you have to want to build relationships in order, you know, to make this work. So uh, that's a that's a big part of it. And we we keep a, a, a database of all the partners we work with on any program. So when we get a new client come in, uh, we do a quick gap analysis based on their profile. Who else have we worked with in this profile? It very quickly creates a list of partners that could be successful with them. Uh, and then in our CRM, we have listed who is their preferred contact at our company. So if uh, Samantha is the preferred company for uh, Forbes, then that's who we're going to go through. Uh, and so it's just, you know, finding efficiencies and able to do that, finding the right CRM and, and other software so that all we have to do is build the relationship. We don't have to try and figure out who are we contacting, who's the right contact, uh, things like that. And it's just over time that you build those relationships. It's hard to automate relationship building, but you can automate everything that goes into that, uh, which makes it a lot easier uh, to have those conversations. And yeah. then a lot of it, you know, one of the key things is picking up the phone. A lot of people still want to do things over email and phone is scary for some, but you pick up the phone. It's really easy to make a connection in yeah. a few minutes than over 72 emails over three weeks. Yeah. And it can ease things too. I find people totally. have communications over email all the time. Um, you've got a sales team now and you, you've you had a, a director of sales for eight or nine years. I'd love to know some of your best practices and tips around that. Cause I know that's an area that a lot of businesses, especially agencies really struggle with is, is how to outsource sales and how to manage a team of salespeople. Yeah. You know, I've made a ton of mistakes. I think the first, uh, the first thing is an incentive plan that protects your profit and is um, incentivizing the sales uh, team to do what you need done. And so I think at my first uh, salesperson, we paid in commission only. I'm embarrassed to say that. And his results were nothing he, because it was really hard to make a living in selling an agency type product on commission only. And that didn't work out. Um, and then we swung the other way and we gave too much away. So you really have to know what your margins are. So if you don't have a good handle on your, your, your profit per client and your profit per FTE, then hiring a salesperson is, is uh, it may create a ton of business that you're losing money on every dollar you're bringing in. And so you got to balance that out. So knowing what, what is the all in cost for a new customer acquisition? What is that? So is it 10%? Okay. What's 10%? How do you now work that into uh, a salary plus commission? Uh, and then what is the commission? You know, what kind of sales do you want? Um, we, we, our contracts are retainer plus performance, and they, we have some clients that have been with us for 10 years. So these are ongoing things. And, uh, you know, you probably know this, getting a, I'm sure you know this, you, acquiring a new customer is way more expensive than keeping a good one, uh, you know, a current one there. And you get more efficient with the work you're doing with that client over time. So year two, three, four, and on can be really, really profitable. And so do you need, uh, do you want to incentivize on year two, year three, and how does that work? And, you know, model it out 
Uh, so you know what your profit is when they bring those on and incentivize them accordingly. And that that's uh, so we swung to the other direction and paid way too much. And it's always a great conversation to say, I want to pay you more sales team. It is always 100 percent an awful conversation. And you risk losing all of your sales uh, team members when you have to change a commission to be less profitable uh, for, or more profitable for you, but it ends up being less profitable for them. And that can really piss people off. So you don't want to go out with too much that you may have to bring back. And so we've been able to find, um, you know, commission structure for our sales team that, uh, and our sales director knows, like when you bring your client in, here's our all in cost. This is what you have to work with. So if you need to incentivize your team, you have this to work with and nothing more. And so that factors his salary uh, and their compensation and all of that. So it's, it's really, you have to have a handle on your financials, your reports, yeah. your cash flow, your, your P and L are the two big cash flow being King. If you don't, if you don't know um, your profitability for each of your clients, then I wouldn't add any more business in until you, till you get it. Cause we have grown quite a bit and lost money and then had to peel it back and kind of rebuild. And it's not, it's, I've learned a lot in every one of those, but you know, I'm turning 48. I don't want to do that anymore. And so uh, those are the things that I would do. And then hire slowly, like really interview um, a lot of different people. Uh, our a director of sales uh, of new business right now is phenomenal. And he was a recommendation from a trusted partner um, and has done a tremendous job, not only in bringing in new business, but being part of the leadership of the entire organization. Um, so uh, a lot of people say they can do sales, um, but not a lot of people actually can. Yeah. Um, and, and you got to know, like strategy and communications are huge for selling agency type stuff. Someone who can understand what we do and what your agency does is super important. Yeah. Um, we're running short on time. So I, I want to wrap up with uh, my gratitude question. I'm a big fan of expressing gratitude, especially to those who've helped you along the way, especially peers and contemporaries. Uh, a lot of times people immediately are inclined to say family or team members. Um, but what I like to provide recognition for is those, you know, peers and contemporaries that have helped you or mentors that have helped you along the way. So who would you want to just shout out and thank for helping you? Well, there's a couple of people at the Bureau uh, of Digital that we're in. Uh, Mark Miller um, has just been a good sounding board to the highs and lows of agency ownership. Uh, Tommy, um, I forget Tommy's last name. Uh, as we had gone through a bit of trying to figure out what all this change in the industry means for our service, he spent a lot of time with me on how do you change what you're doing and how do you lead the team through that? Uh, beyond that, I think of uh, Randall Wilkinson. Randy Wilkinson was uh, is a uh, an entrepreneur locally, a doctor, a pilot. He has sold multiple businesses. I met him uh, through uh, Coeur um, Web Marketers Association that we had years ago here locally. Uh, and he became an advisor, a trusted friend. And looking back, every time um, something would happen in the company, I would run to him completely freaked out. And, uh, and he would calm, calmly kind of walk me through it and spend a lot of time uh, you know, business owner to business owner. And a lot of it was, you know, hey, it's going to be okay. Let's develop a plan. Here's what you got going on. I think of Matthew Ray Scott, who I, I continue to spend time with. I, um, I actually was bringing in a speaker for the web marketers group, and he couldn't join and introduced me to Matthew Scott. Uh, and Matthew and I became instant best friends. And he has advised me so much in our sales process and leadership um, that, you know, I just can't, I, I can't think enough and thank him enough. Uh, Stephen Denton was, uh, at one of our network partners, um, was, uh, when I was at Coldwater Creek was our officer champion. So I spent a lot of time with him and he was instrumental in my early career, uh, as an affiliate marketer and really helping me 
figure out what I wanted to do next and, and uh, how to work within in the space. So there was a ton of people that poured into me early on and, and throughout uh, my career that have been vital to, to our growth. Um, a, lot of, a lot of them brought us some of our first business. Uh, Beth Kirsch brought me uh, so many clients in the past that have done really, really well and help, uh, help us uh, build uh, our name and our brand that, uh, yeah, it's just, there's probably another hour of people I could thank. That's a great list. Um, well, Jamie, it's been such a pleasure talking with you. As you can see in the background, my kids are all here now. <laughs> they are. Yeah. <laughs> Bring right them on here. the podcast. <laughs> uh, no, they, they would t- occupy, uh, occupy all of our time, I think. Um, but uh, where can people go to, to learn more about you? Yeah, they can go to LinkedIn, uh, uh, just linkedin.com slash Jamie Birch. Uh, they can go to jebcommerce.com uh, and find me uh, there. Those are probably the two best places to go. They could email me at jamie at jebcommerce.com. Awesome, Jamie. Thanks so much. All right. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Thank you for listening to the Smart Business Revolution podcast with John Corcoran. Find out more at smartbusinessrevolution.com. And while you're there, sign up for our email list and join the revolution. 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 And be listening for the next episode of the Smart Business Revolution podcast.